Hello everyone, uh, my name is Adam Qureshi, your main name is Billy, I'm one of the anaesthetic consultants for the RVI, I've been in post about five years and I have interest obviously in regional anaesthesia, also paediatric anaesthesia and paediatric regional and um, also things to do with health informatics and digital technology etc in anaesthesia and medicine. Chitris uh, asked me to talk to you today about auxiliary blocks, uh, tips and tricks and it'll be uh, a pleasure for me to do that today. Let's begin. First thing I'd like to say is that this is not intended to be a very detailed uh, lecture or tutorial on anatomy and sonar anatomy, although obviously we will have to cover some of it. I'm going to assume as senior trainees you know the well, the main bits of the anatomy that are relevant to uh, upper limb surgery and we're going to focus there on hand surgery because that's the most common application of axillary blocks. We'll talk a little bit about anatomy uh, but we'll also talk about the more practical aspects and how to do these blocks and that's when to use it and what should you block uh, and that will be about really top-up blocks what sorts of local anaesthetics what strategies there are to do these blocks and uh, a bit of on ergonomics and how to set up the block and, and execute it uh, with finesse so i don't want to do a lot of anatomy but we just do need to look at a couple of essentials so on the left here we've got the brachial plexus as you can see roots trunks division cords and as you know we can block at various levels we can do interscalenes supraclaviculars infraclaviculars retroclaviculars uh, and auxiliary blocks so when we did an axilla we're, we're down here at the terminal branch level and this is just that zoomed in a little bit so you can see the terminal branches and the ones that we see easily in the axilla are the muscular cutaneous nerve uh, the median nerve, the ulnar nerve, the medial cutaneous nerve, the forearm, the radial nerve. Those are the essentials of what's in the axilla. Interestingly, obviously you all well know the axillary nerve is not blocked in the axilla. And we'll talk a little bit more about this nerve, quite an important nerve for upper arm surgery. We'll talk more about this medial cutaneous nerve of the arm. We'll talk about that in a second. The reason why this doesn't work for procedures higher up on the arm is because some of the branches to those areas, such as the the superscapular nerve to the shoulder, for example, uh, comes off much higher, so you can't really catch those um, in maxilla. So as you can tell from that previous two diagrams, the axillary block is really suitable for elbow on the, the lower part of the upper arm and down. So elbow and down is, is how it's usually quoted. It's really good for hand surgery. All of the nerves that take sensation from the hand can be blocked in the axilla. And most hand surgery is done under uh, a palm tourniquet. So the axillary block will also block the nerves that innervate the, the muscles of the upper arm and it's the muscles which mediate most of tourniquet pain. It's not the skin as some people might think. The axillary block is really safe and it's a block which if executed well with the correct types of anaesthetics it comes on really faster. It's good for a quick turnover list. If we're looking at when we should not use an axillary block we're going to be talking about procedures which are more proximal to the the elbow area. So uh, if you're right at the very top of the arm, uh, you're going to be looking at an area which is innervated partially by the intercostal brachial nerve. This is not a nerve that's part of the brachial plexus, so no brachial plexus block will, will, will uh, stop this nerve from transmitting sensation. If you want to block it, it can be blocked um, at a different location in the upper arm, which we'll look at today. But it can also be blocked using a PEX2 or a Threatus plane block because it is actually uh, an intercostal nerve. It's the lateral uh, branch of the T2 intercostal nerve. The other nerve involved in the upper arm on the medial side just above the elbow is the medial brachial cutaneous nerve, otherwise known as the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm. This is a nerve which leaves the plexus quite early on, so it leaves the medial cord before the others. So when you're doing an auxiliary block, it's not actually in the same area as the other nerves, but still it can be blocked near the axillaries we'll come to today. This nerve is quite important in procedures such as cubital tunnel decompression, which are done on the upper arm, uh, just above the elbow on the medial side. It's important to know when you're doing a hand block and you're going to use top up blocks. And by that, what I mean is you're going to put anesthetic into the, the, the peripheral nerves more distally to the axilla. You need to know which ones to target. And I'm not expecting to memorize this diagram, but it's quite a useful thing to just save on your phone. Shows the dermatomes and myotomes in the osteosperms because it's not just about where the skin incision is. You've also sometimes got to take into account where the muscles are innervated by the nerves and if those muscles are going to be implicated in the surgery. Similarly for the bones, if you're working on the bones, you need to know which nerve innervates a particular bone. 
So it's not always as simple as, oh, the, the wound is over the little finger, therefore we must only block the ulnar. It could, sometimes it can vary, and you need to be aware of these diagrams and reference them when you're making that decision. So on the left-hand side here, this is just another view of the dermatomes, but it's got an anterior and a posterior view for the completeness. And I was talking earlier about the interlocked brachial nerve, which innervates uh, a bit of the upper arm. So that's the gray strips here. And then the medial brachial nerve, which is here. So this is the bit that's complicated. This is where we operate when we're doing cubital decompression surgery. So this is, it's important for that surgery. This image just shows you uh, osteoderms from the anterior and posterior view. And all that's pointing out is that, for example, on one side, the phalanxes or the metacarpals can be innervated by one nerve, and on the other side, it can be innervated by the other nerve. So it does get a little bit complicated. Just have an awareness of that and be vigilant for that if you're doing complex of these sorts of building procedures. This is a standard um, auxiliary view. We're going to talk about it in more detail in a minute. One of the things which you may uh, have heard before and you'll hear me reference throughout the talk is the clock face. When we get this view, what we talk about is the auxiliary artery being the clock face and we describe where things are uh, as if it were a clock. So we'll say, for example, here you can see the nerve at about two o'clock. Um, and here is a bit further away from the artery at nine o'clock. So that's how we're going to talk about locations of nerves throughout this talk. Let's talk about each of the individual nerves for a moment. So the radial nerve sits on the conjoint tendon, and this is the conjoint tendon of teres major and lateral side. And its usual position is sitting on the tendon at about four to six o'clock on the artery. So sometimes it can be uh, underneath the artery, but not always. If you see something very bright and circular underneath the auxiliary artery, just be careful that's not post acoustic enhancement, because often that confuses people who are a bit less experienced. The nerve often doesn't sit directly under the artery, and often it's not a perfect circular shape, it's quite sausage shaped, and it sits a little bit off to the, 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 the crane, the, the sort of the cordal end of the artery, so more, more likely five o'clock position. It's closely related to the profunda brachii artery as it extends through the muscle. And this is the first arterial branch of the axillary artery, and sometimes it can help you find the radial nerve uh, further distally on the arm and track it back up to its position on the, on the conjoint tendon. The branches of the axillary of the radial nerve are important to know, so you know where you need to block it for a top-up block. In the axilla, it gives off the posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm, which is the blue bit here, which is involved in the, the back of the top of the arm. And then after the axilla, it gives off the posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which is the back of the forearm, and the lower lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, which is up here. And then it continues down the arm and it wraps around from the back to the actual lateral side of the forearm at the ACF in the, the spiral groove of the humerus. And at the anticubital fossa, it splits into a deep branch, which is known as the posterior anchosis branch, which is predominantly motor, but not completely and it has a, a superficial branch which is sensory and that's the one that runs with the radial artery. Quite a quite a small nerve, not often not often visible on ultrasound. Uh, when we do blocks for hand surgery top ups and we're going to top up the radial nerve, for example a procedure on the back of the hand, we'll be looking at topping it up uh, at the distal humeral level before you get the split of the posterior and cirrhosis nerve and the superficial branch. If we look at the median nerve the sensory part of the median nerve only comes from the hand, and it normally sits at the 9 to 12 o'clock position in the axilla. It's closely, it's closely related to the axillary or brachial artery as it comes down the arm. And that's its landmark for finding it. It stays with the artery. At the antecubital fossa, it gives this anterior interosseous branch, which is predominantly motor, and then the rest of it comes down the forearm, and it enters the hand by the carpal tunnel, and it splits into a palmar cutaneous and a palmar digital branch, which are, both have sensory components. So I usually block it up here before the division of the anterior and trussus nerve, although for hand surgery, this is not really essential. You can block it anywhere in the forearm. Coming on to the ulnar nerve, this is another nerve whose sensory component only comes from the hand, and it sits at the 12 to 3 o'clock position in the axilla, and its hallmark anatomically is that it diverges away from the brachial artery. And so the nerve is heading towards the medial epicondyle of the humerus or the funny bone location. Naturally, you can scan it there if you can't find it and trace it back up to the axilla. It does travel to the cubital tunnel, and that's where it gets uh, compressed into patients who require cubital tunnel decompression surgery. It has a branch in the forearm just before the wrist, so quite distally. And that's a palmar cutaneous and a dorsal cutaneous branch, which are both sensory. And then it goes into the hand via the Ian's canal and gives another two branches. 
So I usually block it mid forearm level. Um, you don't need to be too high because the division is quite late in the forearm. So anywhere in the mid forearm would be absolutely fine to block this. Uh, if you just want to provide some post up analgesia for a hand operation. The muscular tennis nerve is a mixed motor sensory nerve. Its motor innervation is to the biceps muscle. And it's therefore very important for, for tourniquet covers. You need a good block of this in the axilla to, to have a tourniquet applied to a patient. Similarly, the radial nerve innervates the triceps muscle. And again, that's why it's very important for tourniquet cover. The muscular kinase nerve travels between the biceps and coracobrachialis, and it's usually the easiest one to spot in the axilla because it's quite bright. It also has a it, it has a continuation of the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which takes sensory information from the blue area shaded here to the lateral aspect of the forearm. There are some variants, so in some people you can't find the muscular cutaneous nerve in this position between biceps and coracobrachialis. And in those patients, what's happening is the nerve is likely to be stuck to the median nerve. So if you just block the median nerve as you would normally in the axilla, you'll find you do then also get a, a, a block of the muscular cutaneous nerve. In some patients, it can be deep to coracobrachialis rather than sitting on it. And in some patients, it can actually travel through the biceps muscle itself. Let's just talk a little bit about the local anesthetics that we've got and when you should choose which ones. So roughly speaking, there are some quick onset short acting agents. Typically, that would be lignocaine. We use xylocaine locally, but lignocaine is fine. Uh, xylocaine is, comes in 1% in 2% and often we'll just use 1%. The alternative to that is prilocaine at 1%. These volumes here are maximum doses if you're just using these as a single agent in a typical you know, adult. Obviously, if you're mixing local anesthetics, you can't use all that and you would need to put 50 mils in the axilla uh, anyway. Then you've got intermediate onset but longer acting agents, and that would be an example of that would be reprivacaine at 0.75%. And then you have your slow onset long acting agents, and those are your levobuvacanes that are coming in quarter and half percent. When you're thinking about an approach to your axillary block, there's two real ways you can do this when you're considering hand surgery. So if you're doing a, if you're doing an arm a surgery which is on the forearm or more proximal, you need to put your short quick acting local anesthetic and your long acting in the axilla because you can't pick off the nerves to the forearm and the upper arm easily to do top up blocks on. So you need to put all of your anesthetic in the axilla. And you can do the same for hand surgery, but it's not required. But it is an, a recommended technique if you're operating more proximally on the arm. So if you're doing a 20-20 block, as we call it, it's an all in one block and you're going to put about 20 mils of a short quick acting agent like xylocaine, 1% xylocaine in, plus 20 mils of a longer acting agent, and that would be typically quarter percent of the pain. What you get here is a quick onset block, which lasts for a very long time. The patient will have quite a dead arm for quite a long time. Uh, so it, it does kill the arm for a while. Uh, some patients don't like that, but if it's necessary, it's necessary. The other block you can do if the procedure is a hand operation is a 30-10 differential block. And the 30 refers to 30 mils of a short acting agent, like 1% xylocaine in the axilla. And then because it's a hand operation and all of the nerves carrying sensation from the hand are amenable to peripheral block in the arm, what we do is we use about 10 mils, so maybe five mils per nerve of quarter percent levo, to top up those particular nerves in the in the arm and the forearm. And what that means is that you can anesthetize the hand without taking out the muscles of the upper arm because you don't need to have a long acting tourniquet cover. That's what the auxiliary block is for, to give you long acting tourniquet cover. Final G's the hand, you just need for hand anesthesia, so that can be done with forearm and upper arm top up blocks, which is what we typically do with the RVI. And the patient will get a quick onset uh, block, which is good for surgery because it's got tourniquet cover, because you've put some quick acting local in the axilla. And then their post up analgesia will come from those peripheral top up blocks that you've done to the medial on their radial nerves in the arm and forearm using the longer acting agent move on to a little bit about practicalities, ergonomics and setup. This is the, all the photos and videos in this presentation I've taken from my own practice. So this is a picture of how I would set the trolley up. I have a head up to keep the patient comfortable. Patients don't lie completely flat. Nobody likes lying completely flat. So don't do that. Put the, put the muscle a little bit. And then I put a little bit of a Trendelenburg tilt on the table as well. And that just stops them falling down these trolleys. You'll find if you don't do that, the patient will just slip down. This photo, these photos are just showing you the way the arm is positioned. So I like the shoulder to be 90 degrees. Some people will do this and 
what happens when you do this is you slightly change the exact locations of the nerves on the artery, but you also stretch the plexus and you make it more prone to trauma if you apply uh, a needle around the nerve. So this is arguably safer because the plexus is not under tension. Uh, some patients might not be able to get their shoulder to 90 degrees. So in these patients, what you can do is you can ask them just to turn in slightly onto their side. So we're not asking them to go lateral, but just turn in slightly onto the side and that will take the pressure off the shoulder and it makes them more comfortable and then it makes your life easier because they won't be getting um, impatient during the block. I've taken this photo just to show you how I use one sticky sterile drape. I attach it to the handle of the bed and take the rest of it and attach it down the arm. And this is because when you start injecting local anaesthetic, particularly around the musculoskeletal and the radial nerves, the upper arm muscles will start to go and the, the arm can slide off the table of the trolley. So it's handy for anchoring the hand. And when I do this, I find the arm's not going to go anywhere uh, and it's a nice position. Photos. These photos are basically showing you the various types of position that you can adopt when doing the block. So the top left one is how I would do the block. So the treble is, is pumped up nice and high. The operator has their back straight and they can get really quite close to the patient. So in this example, the patient could be closer to the, the edge of the trolley and the operator can stand closer to the trolley. And what that means is that your hands are going to be quite close to your trunk. And so there's less strain on you. You're working closer to your core it's easier you don't have to use as much of your own muscle to do the block so it's more comfortable position for you i have the ultrasound machine on the other side so I'm, everything's in line so the operator the hands the eyes everything's neutral and staring at the screen the upper right photo is a slight adaptation where you're sitting down so if you do this i don't like it because the stool you can't really get quite close to the patient uh, and because the trolley gets in the way and therefore you have to find that your hands are going to be outstretched a little bit further and so you're using more of your own uh, muscles to try and support your arms rather than being able to rest closely and working close to your core. The below right photo is a similar setup to the one above it but the machine has been moved to the head end. Again I don't really like it because you're not really in neutral position, your head's looking more naturally over this way in the machines up over there so I don't like it but it, it, it's fine if that's what you like and the bottom left is something which uh, one of my colleagues Lewis does it does depend on having this machine because you have this kind of flat area of the machine and this was just done for sure but if you're doing this for real you'd have a sterile drape on the machine and the arm is being put out on the machine it's okay uh, you can get close to the patient but again you're looking in a different direction to where you're putting your hands So this is a picture of a, 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 a typical ultrasound view of the axilla. To orientate ourselves, we've got the axillary artery, and you can see here there's just one branch starting to come off the artery. This is the profunda brachii vessel I was talking about, and this is the one that often dives down to the muscle. And is closely related to the radial nerve, which is currently here. The block is best done before this little branch comes off, so we just have one circle of an artery. So if you go a little bit higher up in the axilla, you should find that this artery goes away and you just have one. It's not always possible, but if you can do that, it's ideal. If you can't get just one artery, it's okay to go at this level here. But you just have to be careful when you're going between or underneath this branch that you're not going to actually puncture the artery. This is the conjoint tendon of teres major and lat dorsi. This is the teres, uh, the lat dorsi muscle. I said this is the radial nerve. As you can see, it's not very clear. It's sausage shaped and it sits on this tendon at this sort of four to six foot position. It's not usually down here where people expect it to be. It's very seldom down here, usually here. This is the musculocaneus nerve, which is really bright. It's usually the easiest one to identify. And it sits between this, this square biceps muscle and this coracobrachialis muscle. And as you go down the arm, this nerve will move in, in this plane here. And notice that it's got a really obvious fascial plane. All these blocks in the axilla and the forearm are about getting to the right fascial plane. And for this one, it's really easy. This is really clear fascial plane. Then you have some nerves up here. They're all sort of bunched together. We have the ulnar nerve furthest away. And this is the one that, as you scan down the arm, will move away from the artery and it will head towards the, the, the funny bone location. You have a median nerve on this side. Now, normally, I said it would be over here. In this patient, it isn't. Now, if we change the patient's arm position or applied 
more pressure to the probe or slightly scan the front down. This nerve would probably move over here. But it does depend on these factors as well. Can manipulate where this nerve is depending on the position and scanning technique, etc. But what's important to note is that the order of the nerves around the artery will, will almost never change. It will always go median, ulnar, radial, and musculitaneous in that clockwise direction, although the exact location will vary. We've probably got a nerve here, which is going to be the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve or the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. This is just the same picture, but with some annotation on. Uh, so radial nerve, quite an elongated sausage type shaped nerve, and it will be the least obvious until you put some local anesthetic around it, and then it will light up because of the contrast between the tissue and the local anesthetic. Median muscle, this median nerve, ulnar nerve, and mid, um, medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Musculitaneus coracialis, biceps, alatorse, and conjunct. This is a scan of the, a survey scan of the axilla. So you can see the usual structures, the conjoint tendon, artery, first branch here. As you scan down, watch what the nerves do, and then we'll go back up and we'll talk about what's happening. So here's your central artery here. If we go back up, the radial nerves coming back up here through the muscle. And if we go a little bit higher, you'll see that it's going to sit back on the conjoint tendon when we get to the axilla, which is there again. And this is that first branch again as it goes down. It goes closely to the radial nerve. And we go back down and we're going up again in a second. And you'll see again uh, what happens. These are the other nerves as they spread out. The ulnar nerve is moving towards the elbow. The median nerve is staying with, with the artery. And going back, here's the radial nerve. Going back up, there it is. And there it's sitting on the conjoint tendon. Watch the musculitaneous nerve as it swims between the biceps and the coracobacchialis muscle. So it's really obvious, it's got a really obvious fascial plane. We'll go back up the one artery. Now, the median nerve's here. As we scan down, watch it switch over to its more normal position, which would be over here. But what's important is that the median nerve always stays with the artery. So this is its more normal position. This is the ulnar nerve moving away towards the elbow and the, the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm in between. So there's the renal nerve again. This time we'll watch um, how the radial nerve is blocked. So this is me doing a block. And as you can see, I put the needle in. I don't want to hit that muscle in nerve, so I'm going to go over the top of it. And I've got to a point now where there's one axillary artery, which is here. And I'm going under the artery. And then what I'm going to do is just lever the hub of the needle to lift the artery and poke through the other side of it. I don't really want to puncture the conjoint. Um, so I'm going to push through. And I want to go along the conjoint, which is why I'm doing that levering, because I want to lift the artery up. And as we inject to make some space, you can see something starting to lift up here. Push a little bit further, a bit of a pop. There we go. Pulling back slightly now, because when you pop something, you're always going to end up going too far. So you always have to come back. And watch when we inject now. The, the radial nerve should just lift up on that local anesthetic, and it should become much more brighter. So you can see here now, this is the radial nerve lifting up. Yeah. And it probably you need about you know five six mils of local anaesthetic in the radial nerve. Generally, I'm quite generous with it because that's the one that's going to give you a good tonic cover. Because the median of the ulna and also the medial antibrachial kinase nerve, uh, because it sits between them, if you can see it, they're all in a similar position. We're going to block them in one go now. I did the radial nerve first, uh, and the reason for that is because you should always block deeper and more distal structures first because otherwise what happens is you push them away with your local anesthetic and you can make your other targets uh, pushed further away from the needle point. So go for the deepest, furthest target first and work backwards towards the, the ones that are closest to the needle entry point, which is that's why I did the radial first. So what I'm going to do now is get in, bring the needle back a little bit and we're going to go between the artery and the median nerve, which is here. And I want to get over towards the ulnar nerve here. OK, now I may. What I would suggest is you relax the pressure on the probe at this point when you're trying to sneak between an artery and the nerve, because you, if you compress too hard with the probe, um, you won't be able to create space and it'll cause more trauma. So I'm just tracking here. There's a median, there's the ulna. Just tracking, making sure I know where the targets are. And then I'm going to go under the median nerve and over the artery. And what I'll need to do is just create a little bit of space. So see how that's just lifted the median nerve straight up. It means I'm in the right plane. 
and you need some local anesthetic there just to give you a pathway towards the ulna. So as we've done that, you can see we're pushing the median nerve back, back over to its more normal position. So I'm heading towards its ulnar nerve here. And you can see the ulnar nerve is basically sitting on the radial because I've lifted the radial up. So this is radial here, this sausage here. This is ulnar. And I'm putting in the local anesthetic now and I'm getting the ulnar nerve. I'm going to come back a little bit and I can probably do the median nerve at the, at the same time. So I'm going to put a little bit more underneath the median nerve. I don't worry too much about this medial antibrachial nerve because it's very easily blocked. And because you're blocking nerves on both sides of it, it'll always get blocked. I never particularly target it even when I can see it. So I'm going over the top now. Again, it's not strictly necessary. You don't need to donut nerves. Some people like it. It looks nice on the scan. It's not nearly really necessary. If you've got enough local anesthetic in contact with the nerve in one side, it will work. It might just take a little bit longer, but probably not clinically uh, significant. And you see there just pops through a fascia layer because you'll get lots of pops as you do this. And if the local anesthetic is injecting but not touching the nerve directly, it's probably because you're not quite in the fascia layer and you need to either come back or pop through the next one. See, that looked a bit muscular spread. That one looked a bit honeycomb, didn't it? So we have moved the needle back a little bit. And I'm on top of the median. Probably going to put a little bit more in here. Or maybe I'm going back under it now. So you get that tenting feeling. You know you need to push something. There we go. And again, when you push, you always have to come back a little bit because you, uh, you you go too far when you pop. So more local anesthetic under the median nerve. Ulna's nice and bright. Median's nice and bright. Radial's bright. As we scan down, we can see the spread around all of the, all these nerves here that we've done. And again, I'm not going to go and target this medial antibrachial because it's not really necessary. So we've done most of these three nerves now. Now, in this instance, uh, what I thought was, because I had a lot of local left over, I thought I'll go and put a little bit more on the radial. So I'm going to bring the needle under median now. And there's lots of space because I put local in. And I'm just going to get down to the bottom corner of radial. I put a little bit more around it. So you can see how bright it's getting now. And you see how, how big it is and how sausage shaped it is. It's not a round circle that's found under the artery. It's always over here. So that's enough for radial. Once I've done that, then I make my way backwards. As I said, I'm coming more pro more closer to the needle entry point now, and I'm going to do the musculoskeletal. So you bring the needle back under direct vision. Uh, so you make sure. So if you do it under vision, you know you're not going to pull it out of the skin. And then you just need to get back here and re-angle it steeply to puncture this fascial plane. You can't re-angle the needle when it's through all this muscle. You've got to come back. The muscle would tether the needle. So you have to come back and then make a different approach. And once you pop through this fascial plane here. You can see why I'm in the right plane because the local anesthetic is directly lifting up the nerve. There's nothing between it. So I'm in the right plane. And again, five, five six mils of local anesthetic will do it. And this is essentially for hand surgery. This is just needed for tourniquet because the musculoskeletal nerve doesn't really innovate anything on the hand. You can see we scan down now. All these nerves are all pinged up with local anesthetic. And that's going to be a really successful block because we've seen all the nerves covered in local anesthetic. We know we've done it. I'm going to just talk you through uh, top-up blocks because for hand surgery, what you're probably going to do is put a, a, a higher volume of short-acting agent in the axilla to give you a tourniquet block. And then you're going to do top forearm blocks to target the nerves that are required for that particular operation, uh, the, the nerves supplying sensation from the hand. So for the radial nerve, we're going to scan it as it comes from the back of the arm, wraps around the spiral groove and comes in, in, into the anterolateral part of the arm at the antecubital fossa. And we're going to block it a little bit higher because of that posterior entrosis branch that we want to capture. So have the patient positioned with their shoulders slightly internally abducted, abducted and the hand sort of resting on the tummy is a good way to do it. Just a, as an example to show you what sort of position you're going to have the probe in. This is where the probe would look. So the, the nerve's coming from the back of the arm um, round to the front anterolateral bit here. So as we scan around, watch how the probe, as we go approximately in distally, it comes round with the nerve, okay? So we've got to move more anterior because the nerve's coming out over here. So that's the sort of motion you'll need to be making with your probe.
the ultrasound images associated with, with uh, that scanning technique will look something like this. So what we've got here is you've got the humerus at the bottom, bony humerus, and then you've got this radial nerve. And we're coming scanning down and the nerve's moving more anterolateral. And you can see the fascia plane that it sits in here. You don't want to block it here close to the bone because it's tighter, more pressure on the nerve if you put local anesthetic in because there's not much compliant space there. And it hurts if you hit the periosteum. So block it somewhere like here where we're a little bit further away from the bone. We can identify the plane really easily. Put the needle in and we just need to put, you know, up to five mils of local anesthetic just underneath the nerve. And that's all it takes really to do that. These blocks are often done with quarter percent because they're for post-op analgesia. You don't need to be too obsessive about them because they've got ages to start working because the axilla is what's going to provide you your initial surgical anesthesia. These can, will come on over time. So don't obsess about getting local anesthetic really directly on the nerve. Ideally, you will do it, but don't risk traumatizing the nerve to, to do it. What I would do is I would get the patient to move towards this side of the, of the, of the trolley and put their arm out on the, 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 the cart. Now, doing this is okay, but what it means is these carts are quite low, so you often you will be slightly stooped over when you're doing it. If you sit down, it just makes it difficult to reach, but you can sit down to do it if you wish. I stand up. And when you put the probe on, your landmark is the median nerve in the articular fossa because it's going to sit right next to the uh, brachial artery probably on the lateral side at this point because it moves as it travels down as, it, as the, the artery and the nerve travel down the arm so this is where you're going to block it i block it at sort of high forearm but you can block it further down if you wish this is just going to demonstrate the scanning technique for a median nerve so we're starting off in the anterior fossa as we come down the median nerve is stays sort of in the mid forearms we come around a little bit so what we'll do is this is where you go this is to show where you're going to have to put your probe and then we'll show you what the ultrasound images look at when we do that. So when we do that motion with the scanner, what we get is this sort of image where you've got bone here, median nerve and brachial artery here. And as you scan down, the median nerve becomes a little bit indistinct as you go through the antecubital fossa and then it becomes quite obvious again. So what you need to do is scan up and down. It becomes blurry in this region here, but then you can see quite clearly it's with the artery and then it's there. As we track down, we can see the nerve quite clearly between the muscle layers. This is probably on the nerve over here with the ulnar artery. This is the median nerve here. And you knew it's the median nerve because you tracked it from the brachial artery and you saw how it came down with the brachial artery and then moved away. So the needle's coming in from this side. And again, we need to get into the right fascial plane. A pop through here. I get a little bit of a, of a pop and then you come back, see how much further the needle, end, the needle ends up when you pop. And we just want to put a, a few muscle of local anesthetic underneath the nerve. And watch out when I'm injecting, I'm not watching the needle position, I'm watching the spread. And that's all it takes, a few muscle of local anesthetic. And see the nerves nicely lit up now because it's covered in local. When we do an ulnar top up, you want to be on this side of the forearm and the probe, it's easier to do it with the probe sideways on the arm rather than flat on top. You'll need the patient to externally rotate their forearm a little bit, uh, or you might need to get an assistant to help, or sometimes you can use the, the forearm of your blocking hand to do it while you do it. But we'll watch the video and we'll show you with a scanning technique. So. We're going to scan down here where the ulnar nerve and artery are very close together and we're going to scan up following the artery and we're going to see where the nerve moves away from the artery so that's the position that you're going to be scanning in to find the ulnar on the nerve 
and we'll show you those same pictures now. Let's watch the, the scan pictures. So that's the ulnar artery, that's on the nerve, really close together at the wrist. And as you scan proximally, we're going to watch and we're going to see how the nerve and the artery will start to separate from one another. And what you want to do is find a location up on the arm where the artery's gone away, it's not going to be in the wavy needle path and it's not going to be too close to the nerve. So we're going to look at higher, now the artery is really starting to move away now and the nerve over here. So a little bit higher, see what happens. There we go. Artery's gone down here. Ulnar nerve here. And you know it's the ulnar nerve because it was with the artery. Tendons can look similar, uh, but tendons will, if you scan them, they'll turn into muscle, whereas nerves will stay looking like this. So let's watch the needle come in. And again, you can see a really clear fascial plane that this ulnar nerve is sitting in, really clear. So this is the video that I got one of the trainees to do, so it takes a little bit longer, but it's a good block. And there's the nerve here. We need to get through to this, this fascia plane here. So something's about to pop, you can see everything's tenting. There we go. And we're just going through that second layer there. There we go, popping through here now. So there's the nerve there. So you can see now it's injecting and you are getting some local antenna pushing this nerve away now. And you get a little bit of scanning up and down makes it more easy to identify the nerve and the local anesthetic around it. When you scan it with the needle in view, it becomes difficult to see the nerve. So he's trying to get some local on top of the nerve now, although it's not necessary. I think that's what he's trying to do. Yeah, look at that. He's got some on top of it now. Good. If you remember at the beginning of the talk, I talked a little bit about upper arm surgery and I said that there were a couple of nerves which are not always reliably blocked in axillary block. One was the intercostal brachial nerve and one was the medial brachial kinase nerve of, of the arm. Uh, and these actually, this one's not part of the brachial plexus, this one is, but comes off early off the medial cord. In the axilla, they actually sit over here. So this is the brachial fascia, sits over the left dorsi muscle. Conjunct tendon, and this is the brachial fascia over here. As you can see in this diagram, the intercostal brachial and the medial brachial kinase nerve sit within this fascial layer. So this is a video that's not mine, but you can, uh, I took it from a paper, but watch what happens. So you can see there's a hand gonna come on screen to show you where those two nerves are. And you can see a couple of little bubbles in that, in that fascial plane here. So what you have to really do is inject some local anesthetic along this fascial plane when you do the axillary block, and that will reliably give you a uh, block of these two nerves, and that's important for surgery on the upper arm, things like cubital tunnel decompressions. If you can't be bothered to do that, the old fashioned thing to do was just to inject a wheel of local anesthetic subcutaneously, because that fascia is really, is really superficial. So you just inject five mils of local anesthetic in a wheel on the inside part of the arm up here, and that is reported to give you pretty good uh, success rates for blocking the intercostal brachial and the medial brachial kinase nerve, which is innervating this part of the arm up here together. So I'm pretty much done with what I wanted to say. I just want to come, come back to a couple of tips and tricks, which I may have mentioned some of them in passing, uh, but I'll, I'll reinforce them here. So one of the most important things is that when you're injecting, watch the spread, not the needle, because 
you want to see how the local anesthetic is interacting with that nerve. If you have a big needle in the way, the images get degraded because you've got artifact and reverberation from the metal of the needle. So you can't see the nerve very clearly. When you're moving the needle, obviously you need to see the needle. But when the needle's static and you're injecting, scan off the needle and just watch the nerve and assess the spread. Scan up and down and assess the spread. If you're in the right plane, the local will spread up and down and you'll be able to see that as you scan up and down around the nerve. Get into the right fascial plane, it's really important. All these blocks in the auxiliary and forearm, there's loads of fascial planes, so you have, that's why you have to pop so many of them. But when you pop, you've always got to come back because you'll have gone too far. Do a survey before you do the block, like I showed you on this scan, and assess where the nerves are, how they're moving around the artery, because the positions can and do change. Also, check the Doppler if you need to. When you're testing, I'm not going to say a lot about testing, but with testing, if you've used a quick acting agent like 1% xylocaine, it's okay to do some testing as soon as the block's finished. So as soon as I've done my auxiliary block and my top-ups, I'll do a motor test and I will often see quite a demonstrable weakness of the triceps, biceps muscles, and sometimes even the, the median nerve in the forearm and the, and the ulnar nerve in the hand. So what I do is I do triceps for radial, I do biceps musculocutaneous, wrist flexion for median, and finger separation for ulna. And I will detect a weakness almost as soon as I finish doing the block. And that's because of the xylocaine in the axilla working really fast. I'll leave the patient then. I'll do some computer work, some whatever I need to do. And then maybe five minutes later, I'll come back with a cold spray. Uh, and this trust uses ethyl chloride. It's quite expensive. You can use ice or some places use pinprick. And the key to this is don't do it too early. Because if you do a cold spray test and it's too soon and the patient hasn't lost sensation to cold, they're going to lose confidence and faith in you and they're going to panic. So wait until you've got a decent motor block before you even attempt to do a cold spray test. When you do do the cold spray test, you've got to be aware that there's two different sensations that the patient's experience. There's a feeling of some fluid landing on their skin. Now that's a very lot of light touch sensation and that doesn't go unless you have a very, very dense block. So often patients will always feel that light touch of the fluid landing on their arm, but they won't be able to feel the intense coldness of it. Sometimes what I do is I spray the good, the unblocked side and say, look, that's 10 out of 10 cold. How cold is it on this side? And when you do this testing, do it in specific nerve territories. Don't just randomly spray from the fingertips up the arm and say, when, tell me when it gets cold. It's not a spinal. You're doing peripheral nerve blockups here, so you need to test each peripheral nerve's territory individually, so you need to know which parts of the skin are innervated by which sensory nerve. And as I mentioned just recently, beware about upper limb surgery, so on the, on the upper arm, because you do need these two nerves, so test them properly. Sometimes what I'll do is I'm doing something on the high up on the arm, I'll say to the surgeon, have 10 miles of xylocaine on standby, or I'll tell the scrub staff, have, have 10 miles of xylocaine on standby in case the patient's not numb high enough up the arm. And that's not a problem, that's completely acceptable. So that's all I'm going to say. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Just point you to a couple of resources. We have a website, there's great at and there's some really fantastic uh, learning resources on there. We've put some uh, interactive e-modules you can do, paraventables, fasciliacas, other things, uh, loads of tutorials and videos. There are also, all the videos are also available on our YouTube channel, which is Nusgra, and then a few of us in the Department of Regional Analyses at the RVI use a Twitter handle at Nusgra RVI. Uh, so thank you very much for your time today. Hope it's been useful.